Okay. How does that look? It's not too bad, actually. Uh, can you... S Nope. Uh, so cut the cut it to the over there. Like there that? You go. Yeah, because that that's a black hard line right there. That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. So we're live. Let's see if I can watch it. All right. Hope this holds up better than. And are, we, are you still on the phone? Are you? Okay. I can check it out. So I posted on as many places as I could. This is the okay. new location. Let's find out if I can. I'm checking our new screen here, part of one second. Yeah, exactly. So it should be okay. Assuming that this this works the entire time. I think it will. Somewhere you can keep an eye on it. Yeah, I can move over here. I also have to like grab my stuff walk across the top of it. I think it's That's really Thank <laughs> you. 
but to snorkelers, swimmers, anyone who really cares about our planet um, and enjoys the ocean, everything that the ocean holds. Um, quick shout out to Marine Science Society for being here tonight. They're another one of the recognized student orgs. They really helped to put this event on and to make sure everything went smoothly and to keep me sane all at the same time. So I did have a thought walking into the room uh, this evening, and that thought was, Autumn has never been to Penn State. She's never been to Happy Valley. She doesn't know what we do here. So I thought the only appropriate way to welcome her to our stage is to give her a big Penn State welcome in the way that hopefully everyone in the front row knows, and hopefully all of you know as well. So if you know the words, chant along. If you don't know the words, well, that's going to change really, really quickly. So, without further ado, we are Say! We are Say! We are Say! Thank you. You're welcome. And without further ado, I now present the founder and CEO of Stream to Sea, Autumn Blum. Well, thanks everybody. Is this a little too loud? Can I in my ear? Am I good? All right, excellent. Um, thank you so much for being here tonight, and of course for Nikki Divers Club for inviting me. Um, it's an absolute honor and pleasure. Um, tonight we're going to talk about sunscreen and contaminants. Before we do, I'd like to just get to know you a little bit. Who's in this room are divers? <laughs> right on. All right, I'm among friends. This is good. <laughs> Who's not a diver? We've got some work to do. Okay. We're, we're not giving any dive training tonight, but that can be discussed afterwards. I had some friends in the room who can help with that. All right, but what we're really going to talk about is sunscreen contaminants. There's a lot of uh, media and publicity going out right now, which means it's becoming popular, which means it's becoming trendy, and it also means that um, there's a lot of marketing deception going on. So, obviously, educated room. Hopefully, by the end of the night, you'll be even a little bit more educated and know how to tell if the product that you're using is actually safe or if it's just kind of trendy, okay? Everybody received the sample before they walk in the room? So everybody have a little card, a little ingredient to avoid card, that's important. Awesome, okay. You'll need it later, you don't need it right now. So introductions, um, I'm Autumn, thank you, Christine. Um, I am a cosmetic chemist. I've been formulating natural products and organic skincare for about 20 years now. Um, I'm also an ocean advocate. I'm a technical diver. I've been diving since I was 14 years old. And I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've had several businesses. I have a small group called Scuba Girls. We run some dive travel, do some training down in the Keys. But really, the day job is string to see. Um, I started a company a year out of undergrad, uh, making organic and natural skincare products. I sold it in 2009 and was working for the company that I sold it for went on vacation, which is foreign if you're an entrepreneur. Anybody who's a small business owner knows you don't really go on vacation. But as an employee, I got to do that. And I'm diving in Palau. Um, this was five years ago now um, with John, who is the photographer of all the images George is watching coming in. We'll talk about those a little bit when we're done if I don't try on too long. So we're diving in Palau, and it is the most beautiful, pristine, healthy reef that I've ever seen. It was spectacular. Um, I'm coming up towards my safety stop, and then I saw a rainbow sheen. I'm like, oh, look how beautiful. As I got closer and closer, I realized that was not a rainbow. It was an oil slick. And I was coming off of a group of snorkelers on the surface. Now, mind you, I've been formulating organic skincare for, at that point, 15 years. And I get back on the boat, and I grab the nearest bottle that I could find that said that it was a reef-safe product. And I flip it over, and I see all the O ingredients, um, oxybenzone, octanoxate, um, uh, the cryolene was in there, parabens were in there, all sorts of petroleum-based products, and it was being sold as something that was healthy and good for us and for the water. That was all. Um, I then looked over and I saw um, a bunch of divers were showering off the back of the deck, and the foamy suds are running overboard. And I'm looking down, my heart kind of sank a little bit. Um, I've been in this world for 15 years, and I never really thought about how these products affected our world and our waters. I knew how they affected us, just never really went that step further. Um, before I left that trip, I knew what I was going to spend the rest of my career doing. And that is this. So I left the day job, started formulating Strain to Sea, spent the next year um, testing, failing, and then ultimately succeeding. So we'll talk about that a little bit. 
But our oceans need as much protection as they can possibly get. This is taken in Key Largo. This is a beautiful pillar coral. There's a blight that's traveling along the uh, southeast coast killing off the pillar coral. Right now, that picture on the right is taken five months later. It's rebel now, it breaks my heart. And as everybody in here knows, there's so many things impacting our oceans. And you've got climate change, overpopulation, ocean acidification. Sometimes you just sit there and say, well, what can I do? I mean, there's, it's, it's a little intimidating, right? There are certain things that we can do that cumulatively do add up. Why wouldn't we? I mean, single-use plastics, bring your own cutlery, right? I mean, there's obviously the straws, that's what's popular right now, but anything that we can do is a step in the right direction. And sunscreen is definitely one of them. And it's really exciting that the governments are starting to agree with us. Um, Palau, Hawaii, Bonaire, Aruba, Key West, that one's really exciting. And the Florida Keys, hopefully, and the whole state, and I don't know about that one, but the Keys should be next. Um, Palau went a step further. So there, there's blessings and curses along with what Hawaii's done. Hawaii came along and looked at some of the studies, oxybenzone and octanoxate, Tennessee, however you want to pronounce it, potato, potato, I say octanoxy, have been proven toxic. So com companies out there are taking these two ingredients out of their formulas, replacing them with avobenzone and octocrylene, and slapping a reef safe label on the front of it. Well, oxybenzone, avobenzone. Any chemistry students in the room? Study organic chemistry? Yeah, oxybenzone, avobenzone, they're really close. They're really similar, right? It's pretty offensive. So Palau went a step further, and they ban all 13 ingredients that are on the Hereticus environmental lab. This is a group that is publishing the studies and really keeping this at the front of the awareness. Um, there's over 200 published studies talking about oxybenzone toxicity for both humans and the reefs, but this is the one that's really getting the most media attention today, right? So they ban all 13 of those ingredients, and I say, be like, well, I don't know your ingredients, don't just, just because two ingredients are shown toxic doesn't mean that the rest of them are safe, right? This isn't innocent until proven guilty. Um, NOAA, so how much is actually out there? NOAA estimates that up to 14,000 tons enter our coastal reefs every year. That's just ours. And that's from tourism. I actually think that's a little conservative. It's a huge number. But when you think about it, all the thousands and thousands of tourists that are out there that are being told, apply an ounce of sunscreen to your body every 90 minutes, right? And then jump in the ocean and wash right off. I think it's conservative, and it doesn't take into account the sewage. So I have a lot of people, we're not on the coast here, that will say, you know, I only, I only use safe products when I'm in the ocean. That's awesome, that's a great start. But where does it go when you use it anywhere? I mean, the streams all flow to the sea, right? Wastewater treatment facilities cannot filter out these ingredients. They're um, soluble, and they go right through. If you put a sunscreen containing oxybenzone on your skin, it absorbs into your body, Within 30 minutes, it can be detected in your yard. Okay, so it's right down the train, right? So, do these really impact our health and waters? Studies after studies are showing that yes, yes, in fact, they do. Oxybenzone, octanoxate, parabens, clear and nano zinc. That one gets a little confusing. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, these all have been shown to be very harmful to not just us, but to the aquatic environment. 62 parts per trillion is the, is the smallest amount that was shown of oxybenzone to be toxic to coral larva. That's a really hard number to envision. So they say it's equivalent to one drop in six Olympic sized swimming pools. So it does not take much, and that's enough to deform the larva to where it cannot reproduce, which means the reefs aren't able to recolonize themselves, and that's what we're seeing out there. These ingredients also bioaccumulate, by the way. So if, an, if a creature or a human is exposed to them, you might be exposed to this much, and then later on you're exposed to this much. It doesn't, it all adds up, right? Um, so what does this do to us and various mammals out there? Well, it's toxic to the sperm and the sperm development. How many people are allergic to sunscreen? You know, you say you can't wear it, right? More often than not, it's not sunscreen, it's oxybenzone. It was uh, listed as the allergen of the year in 2014 by the American Dermatological Association. And the same groups are saying that it's really good in the play lots. They're starting to not do that anymore. Um, testosterone blocker increases feminization, basically endocrine disruptors. They mess with our hormones. Uh, again, detected in the urine 30 minutes after exposure. It's also found in semen, placenta, and breast milk. It goes throughout our bodies, right? So you put it on. Sunscreens are regulated as drugs, right? Because they work inside of our bodies. 
So you put it on it, it goes throughout you. Um, in 2008, the CDC did a study and found that more than 96% of Americans had oxybenzone in their bloodstream. That wasn't sampled at Miami Beach, that was in Atlanta, Georgia. They also found it was 85.6% uh, of babies were born with oxybenzone in their bodies. Octinacate is the other one that has become trendy. So a lot of companies in 2005, oxybenzone was shown toxic. So companies took, took oxybenzone out, replaced it with octinacate, which is also known as octomethoxycinate. And it basically has, a, has very similar properties. Endocrine disruptor adversely affects specifically targeting the estrogen, the androgen, progesterone, and the thyroid hormone uh, receptors. It increases feminization. So sometimes we like to giggle in our offices that uh, we're getting a lot more feminine boys these days. Not that there's anything really wrong with that, but it's we believe that there's some very direct causes to increased estrogen during the developmental cycle because of the because of the endocrine disrupting chemicals that their mothers are exposed to before they're born, and there are studies linking that. Again, we all know now, if you put it on your body, it's absorbed into your skin. It is most important. Obviously, I think that um, avoiding these chemicals is important for anybody, but especially if you're trying to conceive, planning to conceive, or have, have a, a child. Anybody in the developmental cycle is very sensitive to these ingredients. Uh, there was actually a paper study, a paper study, a paper published this week that directly linked uh, oxybenzone to Hirschsprung's disease, which is a digestive disorder in babies. So a, a popular uh, old endocrinologist um, reported to say the way estrogen works in a fish and an alligator and a frog and a bird and a mouse and a woman is basically the same. So why are these ingredients toxic? Because they're endocrine disruptors. Just because oxybenzone and octanoxate are proven toxic doesn't mean that the other endocrine disruptors, which they are known to be endocrine disruptors, aren't. Because it's all the same method of action, right? So does the endocrine disruption make any difference? Well, they did a study with zebrafish, a common laboratory study, and exposed them to a little bit, and the males turned female, and the females turned male. There's a fish named Pat in Hawaii. It's a parrotfish that some of the local, local uh, surfers have named, and he, you know, fish will transform, right? Well, he's like, like their poster transgender fish. He's stuck. He's not male, he's not female, he's right in that transition stage. He's been there for more than a year. They all know him. And of course, it's a very popular tourist area, so there's lots of sunscreen in the waters there. So on the reefs, that little image right there is a healthy coral fragment on the left. The one on the right was exposed to a common sunscreen ingredient. For 96 hours, it was completely bleached. Um, at least the, once the coral is bleached, it's not dead, but it's more susceptible to death, right? It's, it's not healthy. Um, these ingredients also, when they're exposed to very small concentrations, they are more susceptible to climate change. So if they would typically bleach at, say, 86 degrees, it can knock it down to 82 or 84 degrees. And octanoxate basically has the very similar effects, again, because it's an endocrine disrupting chemical. The one on the left, healthy, normal fragment. The one on the right was exposed to one part per billion and was completely bleached. So how much oxybenzone is actually out there? The uh, researchers went out in 2015 and sampled various sites around Hawaii and found over on the left, Nama Bay, 4,252 parts per trillion. And remember, 62 parts per trillion is how much was shown to be toxic. Okay? Um, up in the tip over there, Hana, they didn't have any. That's awesome. You can't swim there. You died. Um, <laughs> Honolulu Bay, 1,900 parts per trillion. So it's definitely in the waters in very serious concentrations. Um, I was told that this is Steven Tyler's house up there. You guys know Steven Tyler's? Showing my age there. Um, he, was, he was saying that uh, it was a beautiful, healthy reef. He used to like the snorkel there, and now it's all gone. What's going on? The researchers came over, they tested the waters, and they found 5,400 parts per trillion of octanoxate there. But that was after, in 2015, it was 1,500. And again, they took oxybenzone out, replacing these other chemicals. And you can clearly see with the sampling time. And again, 105 parts per trillion is how much is shown to be toxic. Uh, Virgin Islands, Trunk Bay, this is a very popular beach destination. This is not parts per trillion, this is parts per billion, 1,395. There's not a whole lot to see if you go snorkeling there. Florida, same thing, my home. 
um, 4,474 parts per trillion. The interesting one there is the camper. There's not a whole lot, but that's illegal. It's been not permitted for sale or use in the US for quite some time. Same thing with hubbas. We're still finding them. So long term effects, right? Things out the sand. This is an interesting picture. This was sent to me by a coral scientist, Bill French. Um, used to work for NOAA, I believe. I think he still does. He took a group of coral students, um, scientists out snorkeling, and he uses our sunscreen. He was sharing it with the kids, and one of them said that she couldn't use it. She had to use her own. She put it on. It had all the nasty chemicals in there. They go out snorkeling. They're surveying the coral. It's a little bit searchy, and she wound up hand planting that beautiful brain coral just to keep from crashing into it. And a week later, they came out, and you can really clearly see that hand planting. Wow. This one's a little bit hard to look at. This is a dotty back larva um, to talk about the developmental cycle, how important it is. On the left is a normal, healthy larva. In the middle was one exposed to some sunscreen. Its internal organs has exploded. The one on the right had an aneurysm. Oh, gross. That was 24 hours, by the way. This is a friend who went to a park and saw a guy standing there with that aerosol sunscreen spraying his feet. Came back a day later and the grass was all dead. <coughs> so the, speaking of those aerosol sunscreens, right, you're spraying it all over. How much do you think actually hits the target? Are you putting it on you, it gets all over the boat, it gets everywhere else, it goes down. 450 meters is how far they shunt to be able to carry. And again, these ingredients suck into the sand. So silica acts as an absorber for that. They accumulate, they bioaccumulate, they hang out in there. And what happens in the sand? Well, sweet little birds go and nest in it. We're finding these ingredients in the birds and the bird eggs. And our sweet little turtles in the shells and in the fish that we are consuming. So everybody hears about mercury contamination levels in sushi. Well, we've got sunscreen in there too now. So how do we be a conscious consumer? We've got that ingredients avoid card, right? On the back of it, it's really easy. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a chemist. And of course, I'd love you to use my stuff. But there's good products out there. It's being a conscious consumer. So you pick a product up off the shelf, go into your bathroom, and I pick it up. Flip it over and look at those ingredients, especially the uh, the beginning ones, the active ingredients. If you're talking about a sunscreen, just take a quick peek. The, are they are they on the right? You have anything that says camphor? Is it a benzophenone? Clear and nano zinc. I want to talk about that one for just a second. That's uh, that's kind of a little controversial in the safe sunscreen world. Um, we all know to look for non nano. Has everybody heard that terminology? If you want to use a mineral sunscreen, um, zinc and titanium, you want to look for the words non-nano. Nano ties, basically, the way that you can make a sunscreen not pasty is by adding oil to it, so it spreads really easy. Makes you really greasy, makes your mask slip. I don't like it that way, but it's safe, it's good for it. Or you can nanotize, you can make the particles small. Well, clear zinc, what they're doing is they're making the particles really small, and they're smooshing them together. If you look at it under a scanning electron microscope, you see all these little particles smooshed together. You look at the material safety data sheets of these products and these ingredients, they all say that they're a product toxic, yet they're showing up in lots of our products that are saying that they're free, safe. So that's one that's not real trendy or it's a little controversial for me to talk about, but I talk about it because knowledge is power, right? So it's easy to do. Just look, read your ingredients is the, is the, just on that one. So chemical sunscreens versus mineral sunscreens. I'm a chemist, I get like terminology, I fight against it, I say, well, chemicals, right? I mean, everything we breathe, it's all chemistry, it's all chemicals. But the way in the world, everybody talks about chemical versus mineral. What they're really talking about is UV absorbing chemicals or UV reflecting minerals, right? So the UV absorbing chemicals is what we're all used to, it's what we grew up using. It's, uh, you know, like goes on like jargons, like on a body lotion, smeared all over. It's inexpensive, it's, it goes on easy, it smells nice. And it works, you're not gonna get sunburned if you use it. You have to apply it 15 to 30 minutes prior to exposure. The reason for that is for those ingredients to soak into the fatty layers of your body, where you can then absorb the UV radiation, your body filters it out. That's why the regulated drugs, right? They work inside our bodies. The mineral sunscreens, go on to the next one, zinc and titanium, the way that they work is, as long as it's not nano, it works by creating a reflective barrier. So you should see it. It sits on top of your skin and reflects the UV radiation away from your body. Then you wash it off when you're done. I like that concept a whole lot better, reflecting as opposed to absorbing. If you're trying to protect your body from the sun, why are you absorbing radiation in your body? Makes no sense. I don't get it. The mineral sunscreens are also much more stable. Um, the common UV filters, 
as soon as they're exposed to UV light, they start to break down. The minerals really don't, right? They're much more stable. Some dispersions are clear, but again, you now know if it's clear zinc, chances are really good that it's not going to be safe in the aquatic environment. So mineral sunscreens need to be applied differently. We're all taught apply copiously, apply often, smear it on. You, know, you, you squirt that bottle, it'll make that sound, right? Right? Smear it out, rub it on, rub it all over. I've got too much here, honey, I'm gonna put some on you. That's what we've all done. But with the mineral sunscreens, you have to apply in sections. You take a little bit, pea size, large pea size amount, place it in the palm of your hand, smush it together, pat it on, then blend. Do the same thing for your other arm, blend it in, same thing for your face. Takes a little bit more effort. But once you put it on, you shouldn't be greasy, you shouldn't be cast in front of those light. You should see it, right? It's not gonna burn your eyes because that those other ingredients that are the allergens burn the snot out of your eyes, and then you're underwater fibers, and all of this, you're underwater and you can't rub your eyes, but you get the sunscreen in there. That will not happen with a well-formulated mineral sunscreen. Lots of advantages there. But you do need to apply it differently. Now let's talk about SPF factor. I was asked if we have an SPF 462. No, we do not. We have an SPF 20 and an SPF 30. So everybody is told, I mean, it's an American way, right? More is more. If, I, if I'm protecting myself from the sun, let's use an SPF 1,000. I will look you in the eye and say, even if you are Canadian and haven't been out in the sun for 16 years, an SPF 30, as long as you apply it properly, you're not going to get sunburned, right? So SPF is a factor. It's a protection level of time, not strength. So if you can spend 10 minutes in the sun without burning and use an SPF 30, theoretically you can spend 300 minutes in the sun without burning. But you have to reapply every 80 minutes. So what's the difference, right? So the actual level of UVB is UVA rays, UVB rays, then we say the UVC rays. The A rays are the ones aging, which is no wrinkles. So UVA aging, UVB is the burning rays. So for the UVB burning rays, an SPF 20 will block about 95% of those UVB rays. That's enough for most of us if you've got any sort of pigmentation. Um, if you're really pale Irish, um, an SPF 30 is going to block a little more than 97% of those UVB rays. An SPF 50 is going to block less than 1% more. So the increase between that 30 and that 50 is less than 1%. It's very, very difficult to get there without either being tasty. I could make something like that, but you don't want to use it. I don't want to use it. Or you have to use the chemical ingredients. I just don't think it's worth it. Is that clear with everybody? You guys understand that? That's one of the biggest confusions out there when it comes to sunscreen. Personally, I, I think it goes back to marketing deception. You can charge more money for an SPF 30 to 50 than you can a 30, but they like to cover up and reapply if you don't rate. So some of the testing, what we did a little bit differently. Again, I've been making natural products for 20 years now. And when I made my first formula for Stream to Sea, it was a shampoo. Um, shampoos are notoriously different, difficult to make in the natural products industry to be performance-based. Usually they have no leather, you know, they, they leave your hair feeling like straw. If it's going to be a clean, natural product, it's difficult to formulate. So that's one that I tackled first. And I was so stinking proud of this formula. I mean, it was it was beautiful. And it was clean, it passed Whole Foods premium standards, it was eco cert compliant. And I sent it off for a product toxicity testing and I killed every fish in the tank. And I cried like a little girl. And I started over. Um, very different formulation strategy. Fish are different from us. Just because something's safe for us doesn't mean it's going to be safe for our fishy friends. Doesn't mean it's going to be safe for the reefs. And as far as I'm aware, we're the only company that's actually doing this testing, and I take a lot of heat for it. Oh my God, we're killing fish. I cried, I don't want to kill fish. But I also didn't want to be ignorant. And now I'm not, so we don't have to kill fish anymore. So but so we did some testing, and starting with the sunscreen, this one was really interesting. I compared it to another product. I compared ours, beautiful mineral-based, EcoCert compliant, titanium dioxide, non-nano white sunscreen. And I compared it to one that said that it was bait safe, but it had oxybenzone, octanoxate, and parabens in it. This is nasty stuff. This, how, how can this possibly be bait safe? It's gonna kill fish like crazy, right? So I sent it off and researcher called back and says, hey, guess what? Your sunscreen didn't kill any fish. The competitors only killed 30% which in the eyes of the EPA means that it's safe, right? It's all about mortality. He was like, okay, well, that's interesting. I guess that's a good thing. He says, yeah, but wait a minute. We started looking at them. And guess what you're gonna see? 
So swimming behavior, she started looking at what, what they were actually doing their developmental cycle, their behavior cycle, and swimming, she says they weren't, she took some videos of performing, they weren't floating upside down dead, but these fish were swimming upside down. They were doing handstands. They were bumping into the side of the tank. And of course, little hippie girl, me, I'm like, get them out, get them out, get them out. But uh, so they, they were not happy fish. And of course, ours, they were swimming around, they were normal. You know, it was cloudy water, and it was, they were normal. And then the feeding behavior, same exact thing. Within 24 hours, our fish were feeding fine. The competitor's fish had absolutely no interest in, in the food there. So they were pretty messed up, and that was a, a safe formula. In the eyes of EPA, that is a safe formula. Coral larva testing, same thing. We, we did the, we went out to um, Tropical Research Station Center one with, uh, it was Eckerd College, my alma mater, that's where I went to college. Um, they, they went out and collected coral larva, and we did some settlement studies. So the larva, in order for it to reproduce, it needs to settle on the substrate. And what we found is that ours did not significantly affect the settlement of the larva. We lost the sunscreen in there. And of course, the competitor most definitely did. Those coral were not going to reproduce. And if they did, we probably wouldn't want them to because they would encase themselves in their own skeleton and it'd be ugly. That's what happens when they're exposed to oxidants, by the way. One of the things. So, of course, we have two different sunscreens, and I want you guys to try it because, again, we talked about the application, right? This, I believe you guys have a mix, right? Some have the white, some have the tinted. And I just want to show you real quick, if you don't mind, open yours up just so you know how to apply a mineral sunscreen. And I really do like the tinted. Um, I thought that when we launched it that we would no longer sell the original, but we actually sell the original 3 to 1. It's pretty interesting. People like to know when to reapply. So if you put it on, you're going out on a boat, you can put it on, go do a couple dives, you come up, and usually you'll find that your mask will have rubbed off a little bit. Right here, reapply some, you're good to go. Or just reapply. So you just take like a pea-sized amount, rub it on, People like to do that. Right? Just go like that. I'll do that just to get it. But I want you to play with it, feel it. It should should be non-greasy, and that's how you apply it, though. Just a little bit in a section, and then do the next section, and do that with my mineral sunscreen. Do it with any others. That's the way you should be happy using them. And the best sunscreen, of course, is one that you're actually going to use, because we don't want you getting burnt or cancer either. And as I mentioned, the first product that I formulated was a shampoo, and we failed. So it's wonderful that people are talking about sunscreen. I love it. But it's everything that we use at our home. You know, it's our laundry soap, it's our shampoo, it's our conditioner. These things all run to the sea. Be a conscious consumer. Pay attention. Look at it. It's easy. Once you train yourself with different ingredients to look at, you know, you're starting to read the ingredients in your food, you can't really pronounce them, look it up. Just because you can't pronounce it doesn't mean that it's bad, right? But it means that you should look at it twice. That's shameless plug. All of our tubes are made from sugar cane resins. Uh, I said, I'm putting in petroleum based plastic. I figured that'd be hypocritical. Trash guards. So, some of the things that you can do um, sunscreen, I make sunscreen, but I don't think you should be out laying out in the sun. I don't think you need to put it all over your body, right? If you're hanging out, you're going paddle boarding, snorkeling, whatever, cover up. You know, use a UPS shirt, wear a hat, hang out in the shade, and then apply sunscreen to your exposed skin. It is important to use. One of the arguments that the chemical lobbyists are using against us out there is, well, we don't want our people to get skin cancer. We don't want them saying, well, sunscreen is bad, so I just won't use it. No, we just want you to make conscious choices, right? Do protect yourself, do protect your skin. And that's a little dog, I'm adorable. I love that little guy. So some of the really easy things that you can do to help preserve our waters uh, every day in our day-to-day -day life, we can make a difference. Just being a conscious consumer, we can't wait for our government to do it. Whether the government bans these ingredients or not, if you're a conscious consumer, teach people, tell them about it. When they come into your dive center, they're going snorkeling or diving, they're going on a trip, hey, what sunscreen are you bringing with you? What the conditioner that you're using? Read the ingredients, make sure it's safe, right? If you have big mouths, we can help educate. <coughs> Take free for the sea. That's one of my favorite initiatives. It's on Instagram, and they they're all over the place. Every time you go outside, pick up three pieces of garbage. Fun little game. You can tag. It's just fun. Good things we can do. Sustainable seafood. You guys, if you're not vegan, you like sushi. Sorry. Yeah, I need to give that up, but I can't. So I use Seafood Watch. It's a great little app, and it'll tell you what's what's a better choice. So I don't want us to have to be extremists. You know, if you want to be extreme, I'm going to applaud you. But the majority of us, in order to make a big change in the world, we all need to be able to make a difference. It's another way that we can do it. Spread the word. Let your friends know. Our oceans are essential, not just for our recreation, but for our life. This is where our oxygen comes from. This is where a lot of our 
medicine comes from. It's essential for our atmosphere. It's essential for us. We need to protect it and use all the help we can get. Finally, the last thing I want to leave you with is what I originally said about um, marketing deception. There's no common, there's no standard, there's no agreed upon terminology for what, what is reef safe. People are taking out some ingredients and saying that it's reef safe. It doesn't exist. You have to be an educated consumer. Um, we've tested and proven, we've tested on freshwater fish, saltwater fish, sea elegans, and coral larva. I hope more companies choose to do the same. But in the meantime, if you want to buy a product, ask. That's the consumers are driving the change today. Ask for change because our world deserves it. And I'd love to answer questions for anybody. Sure. So the question was tanning lotions. Um, are they safe or are there tox are there low toxin tanning lotions? Some of them are horrible. I mean, do not put that on your body and don't go lay in a tanning room. Come on. Use a tanning lotion. If you want to. If you want to be tan, great. There's a DHA. You can buy them in the health food stores. Um, just there's safer alternatives, and DHA is one that's been proven to be okay. I don't know how it is in the environment. Don't put it all over your body and go jump in, but it seems to be a pretty good choice. Great question. Thank you. Yes, sir. How quickly do the um, chemicals end up diluting over time if we're not contributing? So if, you know, if people stopped wearing all these um, chemical, you know, dangerous sunscreens, how long would it take for the reefs to become safe and save themselves? That's a fantastic question. So he just asked how long it's going to take for the reefs to get rid of these ingredients. Uh, if, if, am I understanding that right? So if we stop using oxybenzone, we stop using these harmful chemicals, how quickly will the world heal itself? How quickly will the ocean flush it out? Uh, well, it is bioaccumulating in the soil. So every time that the, especially in the populated beach areas. So it's on there, the waves are lapping it up, and it's going back out, which is one of the ways that we think that is staying in the environment. Um, that said, we're really excited uh, to do some studies. Uh, the results of some studies that I know are going, that are happening in Hawaii. The ban doesn't take place until 2021. However, the consumer awareness, um, the, the concentrations of usage is falling drastically. The chemical lobbyists are going crazy trying to uh, stop all of this education and stop the progress of these bans because their sales are tanking, which is awesome. Um, it, it's going to take some time, but I believe that it will fix itself rapidly. The ocean wants to be healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime I go to a talk like this, um, my first reaction is to tell everybody that I know, right? Um, Thank you. We need that. Is all this information like on your website? Um, can I find like the studies? Absolutely. Like, everybody's going to buy your studies. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it's convincing them to be educated. Absolutely. Um, we believe in full disclosure. All of our testing is on there. Our test methods are on there. Um, I've had people say, well, aren't other companies going to do this? I'm like, I hope so. I so hope so. Um, yeah, it's all on there, our website. Did I say that there were prizes for great questions? Did I say that? I have another one. <laughs> so the places that are, are banning all of these chemicals, do they have a way to actually follow through on that? Like if you're banning them in Hawaii, people are usually bring their own stuff from yeah. home. Is this to be something that's taking care of at customs, or how are they going to follow through on that? You know, I'm a big fan of education over legislation. Um, I would love to see the government change and say that these are prohibited. I think it, it, it's going to take a nationwide ban. The FDA, by the way, last week announced that only some, only, ox, uh, sorry, I'm just going badly. Uh, only uh, zinc and titanium are generally recognized as safe. All the other approved ingredients are being required to submit new safety testing, which is a fantastic step in the right direction. And I forgot to ask that question. This is mean, how are they going to? Oh, how are they? How are they going to regulate it? Yeah. I don't know. I mean, how do you regulate? There's um, there's some state parks in Mexico that say that you're not allowed to bring chemical sunscreens. They can only be is it biodegradable and reef safe. It's a little bit loose, but it's okay, it's best in the world from what I've heard. When you show up at the parks, they actually check your bags, and if they see a bad sunscreen, they take it away from you. They'll get it back to you when you leave or whatever. But they'll give you a good sample. They'll give you a sample of the product you use. I think that's a great option. But how do you actually police it? I don't know. I mean. I know when I see somebody next to me that's about to go shh with a big old aerosol thing, I'm like, please don't. Please, please use us. <laughs> yeah. So. 
Maybe That's we can get dive thing. operators doing the same thing. That's the goal. I've had so many people saying, why do you put so much energy into the dive industry? And I'm like, we have big mouths for educators. We're all trained to be educators. Why? This is a perfect market for change. Yes, ma'am. So, okay, I work at the pool. I see a lot of parents and kids who just write off the kids and take right off. Maybe not get them. Yeah. Throw it in and send their kid off. How do you go about like, talking to someone? And, like, like, I've used this and it, it, it is a slower process. So, how do you like, convince someone to take away the community? Yeah, that's that's the biggest challenge because it does take a little bit more time. Um, again, the way that you can make a mineral sunscreen spread better is by adding oil. So with our formula, I reduced the amount of oil in there because aesthetically, number one, I didn't want to make it, I didn't want us to break out. Um, I have very sensitive skin and oil causes a lot of us to break out. And I also um, didn't want my mask to slip. So really I made it selfishly or me. Um, but if I wanted to make one for kids, I would probably have three times the amount of oil because it would rub in a lot easier. And kids don't have that level of patience, and they don't really break out, right? Have a great night. Thank you for your questions. Um, so, so kids, kids products are formulated a little bit differently. It's not that this is any less safe. A kid can totally use it if you can hold still for it, right? But it's it's safety. I mean, the best way I think that you could convince kids by telling the mom that she has to. I mean, look at the studies there. Developmental toxicity is huge. Avoid the endocrine disruptors for kids. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know you guys started with shampoos and the sunscreen conditions. Do you have any plans to even like face washes? I know there's some great issue right now. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking at bar soaps. Um, the, the chemicals, the, the surfactants to use. Surfactants are um, like sodium lauryl or a sulfate, of course, you wouldn't use those. Those are used as a standard for product toxicity in a lot of trials. Um, so I, I like organic bar soaps. I mean, some people say don't use a soap on your skin, but or on, on your face. But if you use a gentle and super fatted one, it's, it's wonderful. But yes, we are going to expand. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, another thing is uh, with the complexity of sunscreen and like rubbing in, adding oil, is it possible to maybe one day make an aerosol sunscreen that's safe? So when you get into aerosols, you're inhaling the ingredients. So titanium dioxide is safe. In the state of California, they require disclosures on a lot of products saying that it's uh, known to cause cancer. And what it is is it's an inhalation hazard, and it behaves like asbestos in your lungs. So when you have uh, asbestos in the lungs, it's fine. I in your lungs. In, in the walls, in your lungs, it's fine. In the walls, it's okay, but when they start breaking apart, it becomes an, an aerosol, and you start inhaling it, so it's a strong irritant. Same thing with these minerals. I don't. I don't think that you should be inhaling any of these chemicals. So it's convenient, but no, I don't. I don't think you should ever do an aerosol or an oil screen or a regular one for that matter. I think those are bad news. Yes, sir. Right. Yeah. Don't don't use petroleum based chemicals when you're playing in my ocean, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the body, you know, there's actually, there's, there's some people that are working on some things with like chida sand where it helps to absorb. Um, I get a little nervous when you're adding other ingredients to help absorb other ingredients. I mean, it's kind of like adding in Malaluca in Florida to clean up the Everglades and now it's too dry. So I get a little nervous with some of those things, but they are working on ways to absorb up some of the chemicals that are in the waters. Really, I think the best thing is, is educating and just reducing its usage. Let it biodegrade, let it do its thing, and feel like the best we can afterwards. Yes, sir. And then we were talking about how the FDA standards are low in regards to uh, chemicals. As in, you put chemicals in, didn't really kill fish, uh, but they did disorient them, kind of essentially ruined the fish body. So, are there any efforts in um, either increasing their standards or at least showing them or educating them? Please have this on bill. So the question was, um, how can we improve the FDA standards for toxicity? And it's actually the EPA standards. Maybe I misspoke, I misspoke on that one, but it's the EPA test methods. And I don't know, that would require a lot, a lot of dollars. That's, um, yeah, education. Exactly right. Yes, sir, I think you have a question too. Yeah, I was, was going to follow on the oils question. So, I, and I'm not asking you to tell me the competitors, but, uh, you know, there's products like, Dr. Brown's, sure. they're supposedly all natural, mm -hmm. supporting the whole 
those who solve this problem and we can find other other ingredients that right. So, so I have Dr. So the question was, um, can some of these other products, if you use natural vegetable base, can it solve the problems um, of what we're using it in the waters? I have Dr. Bronner's in my home. Um, I've been using them for a good long time. I think they're great. It's it surprised me when I did aquatic toxicity testing and my product, my initial formulas failed. So I really do believe that there needs to be a test method, a test standard, um, to determine what actually is safe, and that's going to require non-manufacturer, um, I think. To be leading that charge because I can say what I believe is for you safe, but convincing the rest of the world to follow that it shouldn't be my standard, it should be either industry standards, which I think we are discussing. That we've, uh, we're in a member group called the Safe Sunscreen Council, which has 12 member companies right now. It's um, it was inspired by Dr. Craig Downs of Coreticus Environmental Labs, and uh, we're working on some, some different topics and standards out there. And there's some disagreement, but it's also it's, it's a start, it's a very uh, young industry. And it's wonderful that we're collaborating and working together on it. Yes, ma'am. So her question was, what testing do we do that the EPA hasn't standardized? So biodegradability, for example. Um, bio, it was really difficult to find a lab that would test our biodegradability, which all of our products, I wanted to know, are made. It was readily biodegradable and ultimately biodegradable. And I had to go to, I think it was the sixth lab that I went to that agreed to do a biodegradability study without adding sewage sludge to it. So the typical EPA test method, they're concerned with how products are going to degrade when they go into the sewers and okay? sewers and septic systems and such. And I don't care how it, I mean, I, of course I care, but what I really want to know is if we go to, if we go hiking and we use my shampoo in the river, how quickly is it going to biodegrade? Or in the ocean, how quickly is my sunscreen going to biodegrade? And that was actually really hard to find a lab that would do it without adding activated sewage sludge. Um, so that's that's one example. I think it's just creativity, and it's thinking about it. it's creating the standards, the universities. Um, when I partnered with Eckerd College, I wasn't as concerned about toxicity. The EPA has that toxicity test that that other company uses, says that it's bait safe. I really don't care how many are going to die. I want to know how healthy are they, right? So I had to work with a university to create new standards for us. And what's the appropriate level of addition? You know, how much do you, what's the concentration? We had to extrapolate, okay, if you're taking a shower in a bathtub and then a fish happens to jump in the bathtub, you know, what, what are the right levels to test? And um, it's, um, I think it's really students and universities that are gonna create that for us. Good question, thank you. Yes, you. One of them is more of the active one, and the other one does mm -hmm. the right. drugs, what the drug actually does. You're so, famous, aren't you? Uh, You're trying to get me. Yeah. <laughs> and so, is, do you know, is both of them just as harmful? Uh, the configurations are, they were able to change the configuration to be like the S configuration that's inactive to kind of mix. So he's asking the chiral state, which um, which oxybenzone, which state is toxic, and I honestly don't know the answer to that one. We could reach out to Dr. Craig Downs, who did some of the studies on there, and he could probably tell us, but I would imagine that it's whichever one occurs um, in the lab. None of it occurs in nature, so it's not really like we can say one state is natural and one isn't. It's just whatever is stable is going to be tested. Well, it's hard to see there. Yes, ma'am. Um, so I don't mean to sound stingy about this, but for like college students who have no money, and especially those who burn really easily, like me, right. they have to constantly reapply probably sure. like half of a bottle and just a day at the beach. Uh, what's kind of like the price difference between the safe sunscreen and the kind that you can easily get in bulk <coughs> at the store that has all the more chemicals? And what can you kind of do to buy it easier? And sure, that's kind a of great get question. That worry? So we're asking about the economics of using a safe or a natural product. You know, like if you buy organic produce, a lot of times it's three times higher, right? And some skincare products are three times higher as well. When we priced our products and we looked at the marketplace, you know, you've got La Roche, you've got, you've got everything on sunscreen for this size product that would retail for $4.99 to $34.99. I mean, the, the range is huge. And what's the difference? I mean, 
again, I'm a cosmetic chemist. There's some ingredients that are better and more expensive than others. But I really couldn't justify how could this company be charging $35 or $60 even for this product if the ingredients really weren't that much more expensive. Um, but what, what can you do? Well, a mineral sunscreen, first off, one like ours, it's very, very concentrated. Um, the FDA regulates what you say on the back of the bottle. Um, application instructions, this is a fly liberally. I'd really rather you not apply it liberally because it looks stupid and you're never going to want to use my product again. So it's yes, apply it all over and reapply often. You know, apply it to so skin and reapply, but you don't want to do a large percentage. You don't want to do a big old log. You will not go through a third of a tube or half a tube in a weekend at the beach. Um, it's much more concentrated. Healthy ingredients usually go further. And I would say play with it. I mean, it's, it's an investment in your health. Yes, your, your initial cost is going to be higher. Um, hopefully, you'll use less and you'll be healthier for it. Yes, sir. So, what's the best way of disposing of toxic products? Oh, that's a good question. That's a scary one. In Hawaii, they're incinerating them. Um, I, I recommend hazardous material disposal days. Most communities have like a hazmat day. And literally, we did a swap out. We, we went to a lot of our dive centers three years ago and said, if you have sunscreen with oxydensone, or parabens in them that will give you a dollar for dollar trade out because I wanted them off the shelves. Well, then I sat there with like barrels of stuff. I'm like, oh my God, what do you do with it? Right? It's it's a tough one. I mean, what's the right method? I took it to the asthma center. And what they did with it from there, I probably should know, but I didn't want to know. The best thing is to reduce the consumption of it, I, I believe. Just phase it out. Yes, ma'am. Saltwater fishes. We did freshwater fish and saltwater fish. Um, we started with C. elegans, um, which I didn't know what they were until the toxicology lab told me that we should start with C. elegans because I won't kill as many fish if we do it that way. And as soon as she said, because we won't kill as many fish, I'm like, yes. And then, so that's what we started with. But yeah, both of them. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, for the oceans and places that already are contaminated with very high parts per trillion of yeah. million, um, chemicals, how can we protect ourselves if we want to swim in them now? Ooh, okay. So Dr. Craig Downs has said that he will not allow his children to swim in public swimming pools because he went out and he was sampling the pools and said that the concentrations were just appalling and he believes it will actually soak into your body. And yeah, he, so he won't, he won't let that happen. In the Oceans, I don't think there's enough, like in, in Hanama Bay, where it's the highest concentration. I don't know. I mean, if you can see the oil sitting on the surface, don't do it. Just don't do it. But as long as you've got tidal flow going, I, I wouldn't, I'm, I'm not a fear monger. I wouldn't live in fear. I would just don't put it on your body and try to avoid it. Great question. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good question about, you said how they can't be, there's not a lot of people that don't have this in their body, but they're so common. Does it ever leave the body? So, like, if you yes. have stopped using it now and you've been waiting five years, yes, does it transmit or? Is it yes, they've done tests. Um, there was one that was published in Switzerland, I believe, a couple years back, that showed that they removed these. They had a, a household of, of you know, it was a family with three kids, and they had dangerously high levels of contaminants in their bodies. They took everything out of their world, and one year later, it was basically non-detect for all of them. So yeah, it, it does come out. I mean, it hangs out a disgustingly long time, but just it, it, your body wants to be healthy. Yeah. Yes, sir. Along the lines of that question, um, how long does it take to get out of the portals, especially after they've had the bleaching events? Right. Because I'm imagining they won't reuptake those uh, symbiotic algae until they've gotten rid of these compounds. Right. Right. So. The question is, um, how quickly will the coral heal itself? Um, that's kind of the million dollar question. We're hoping that it'll be fast. And there's some, been some really good news on that front. Hawaii, uh, which was disgusting in a state of decline, they're saying that it's looking up. They're getting areas of regrowth in areas that they haven't had growth for years. They're seeing, you know, the edges are, are healing. Um, I, I, I think we'll see positive change quickly. But it's, it's everything, right? I mean, sewer, sewer systems and the keys um, all the way through. It's, yes, ma'am. Oh, well, I'm that. <laughs> How much of the damage do you think you're actually done by, you know, that province? If we're talking about versus, say, pollution. Can I guys, thanks for coming. 
how much damage to the to the reef do we think came from human activity versus like climate change and human Or I would say like more so these products versus like yeah, it's a, it's a hard question. I don't know. I think that, again, anything that we can do to help to give our reefs a fighting chance, we should do. Um, there's scientists out there that are saying that this argument is um, diluting the message and it's changing the focus. They don't like it. They say, just let people use their sunscreen because we need to be talking about climate change. And I say, yes, let's talk about climate change and let's stop people from using toxic sunscreen, right? How much comes from one? I don't know. Who knows? But once you're educated, why would you use any better, any any different? You know, for you or their reefs, right? Yes, sir. Are all these ingredients of sunscreen disclosed? They're supposed to be. In your experience, are they? Mostly. Um, small companies, new companies that I would like to say don't know any better. It's not widely, it, it is regulated, but it's not widely policed. Um, sunscreens are regulated as drugs. If you see an active ingredient, if you see a drug facts panel on the back, chances are they're full disclosure. Um, if you don't see that, like a lot of the homemade zinc sunscreens and such, they're not regulated, and I personally believe they're dangerous. Um, sunscreen is not something to mess around with. I'm all for kitchen chemistry. I'm all for making your own soap at home, making bath bombs, making body lotions, body oils. Do it. It's fun. I am not for making your own sunscreen. The amount of testing and regulation that goes into it and the challenges, I mean, the, the spreadability, if you wind up, if you get too much in the bottom and not enough on the top, if it doesn't cool at the proper rate, you know, it's not going to have the even dispersion. That's dangerous. You're going to go out and find yourself. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, the study's up there. If you if you Google it, it'll come right to the top of babies with endocrine disruption, and it's on PubMed. You can you can get it readily. Um, what that actually translates to in the form of disruption and the cycle, as an endocrinologist, I personally think that it's horrifying and scary. But what the actual end result is, I don't know. Exactly right. Right. So what the FDA is talking about today is that um, 20, 25 years ago, people weren't using as much sunscreen as they are today, which is why they're wanting to reevaluate the safety standards, which is wonderful. They're right. I mean, 20 years ago, I mean, how much sunscreen women laid out there with a little aluminum foil plates and trying to bake in the sun, you don't really see that so much anymore. But we are using way more than we ever did before. Yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned that, like, only you're talking to that guy there, that uh, most people shouldn't be trying to make their own sunscreen. Right. But I know that there are some people like in Pala, for example, that have made sunscreen. Um, so what are your thoughts? I love her, by the way. Yeah. There's, there's a young lady there that I absolutely adore. This is, uh, what about people that are making their own sunscreen? Um, I spent a lot of time with her, well, not, not enough time with her when I was in Palau. I. She's one of the, I think she's the president of Ocean Sunscreen. Say again? Air storage. There's car oceans, that's it. So how do you make your own? Um, I, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. She's, she's put a lot more thought and effort into it than other people. It's not okay regulated over there. Yeah. Good night. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned uh, on the thing about the oxygen in our bodies. Um, I know you mentioned that it can be found in shorebirds and their eggs and sea turtles. Right. Uh, how much is it to be found in animals that may not be at oceans, like in deer or other terrestrial animals? So, so like, can be in their bodies? How likely is the, is the sunscreen chemicals to be in other mammals that aren't sea creatures? I don't think it's very likely. Um, there's other chemicals that they're finding, like in um, they're in the inland rivers and such. You know, they're finding uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, hormone uh, hormone like pills. Uh, birth control pills or finding things like that in the inland creatures. And I don't think you're going to find a whole lot of sunscreens. It's just not real. Because I know a lot of people use sunscreen when they're out. Right. Now, those birds in that area or those deer in that particular area, I don't think it's been studied, but I wouldn't be surprised if you would find some around there. It's more about um, what's nesting, right? That's where it seems to be holding, hanging on, not necessarily drinking in the water because that by the green so really quickly. Like in the sand when they're nesting, it's, it's holding it in the silica, it's absorbing it. 
Any other questions, anybody? Yes, sir. So, you outside, you said you were outside for this. So, I'm wondering, uh, you were saying these chemicals have an effect where corals weren't able to adhere to the substrate and start growing. Right. And I'm wondering if the, the chemicals in these products are similar to chemicals used in anti fouling inks that they use in burning. Right, like the zinks that are, that are in the bottoms. Yeah. So, I just was wondering if that was, if it was a similar like chemical process or if it was just Process. You know, I, I'm not sure on that one. I haven't studied the paint, the, the coatings, but I wouldn't be surprised. A lot of those ingredients, especially if they have phthalates in them, uh, like the BPAs and plastics have very similar effects. If they're endocrine disrupting chemicals, I would imagine they would affect the DNA of the coral in a very similar way. Any other questions around there? Thank you guys. This is fantastic. Um, yes, ma'am. So should you wear sunscreen every single day? That's a that's a good debate. That's a good question. I think that if you're using a healthy sunscreen, um, I think it's great. We've seen we published an image recently on a truck driver that he didn't wear sunscreen, but you can clearly see like this half of his face he's driving, right? This half of his face was, I mean, like melted. I mean, it literally looked like he was 90 years old. This half, he looked like a 45 year old man. I mean, it's just freaky. So do I think that it adds up? Yeah. I also believe that a little bit of sun's not gonna hurt you. You know, we need our vitamin D, we need our production. I don't think, again, I'm not an extremist. I think that you should have a little bit out there, but if you're hanging out, you're going for walks, you're going playing tennis, yeah, wear your sunscreen, absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, the lights is kind of hard to see. It's okay. Um, so it says everywhere that like the plastic is an active material. Is that yes. Available? So mm -hmm. um, how, how would you like recommend to dispose of like, the actual packaging? Yeah, so the packaging that we use, um, I wish that we could have a completely plastic free product. Um, we struggled with that. Um, how do you create a healthy product and then put it in an unhealthy package, right? I hate single use plastics. I bought these dry bags, I love these things, and the little handles came and wrapped in little plastic things. And I will never order from you again if you send them in this little plastic bag again. Um, but the, the tubes that we use, we use uh, sugar cane resins. We import them from Israel because they have a global worldwide patent for many of this. That is a really unique technology. They're using the glass for waste and sugar cane processing. It actually helps to power and fuel their plant too, so it's considered a carbon neutral process. But the tube itself is actually considered a plastic, it's bioplastic. So, in all intents and purposes, it is plastic. You have to recycle it. It is not biodegradable. You have to recycle it. And just plus in the recycling bin. Any other questions there? Yes, sir. Because I like to sleep at night. <laughs> um, I, it, it wasn't my first thing. It wasn't, um, I didn't start it because I needed a job. I didn't start it because, um, I don't know, I was looking to make a gazillion dollars on it. I started it because I love our oceans and I knew that we could do better. So why aren't other companies doing it? I think there's companies that are trying to. Uh, the animal testing that is hard. Um, I was one of the original signers of the campaign for safe cosmetics back in, it was in 2002 when we were developing that. It was in the National Products Association. Um, we're, we're developing the standards. You don't need to test mascara on bunnies to see if it's going to burn their eyes. There's culture tests you can do. You can do cells in a lab, and you can tell if it's going to be inflammatory. You can tell if it's going to hurt the eyes um, or the skin. There's dermal patches. There's no need to torture animals to do these things. There's no studies like that for fish. There's no studies like that for coral. Um, we have ecotoxicologists and marine biologists, and then we have a group here. Those would be wonderful studies to develop. I would love to see some people work on this, especially as this is becoming more trendy. When I started formulating this line five years ago, the raw material suppliers, very rarely did they have any product toxicity on their raw materials. So I'm looking at the surfactants. What's the toxicity? Well, it's not expected to be toxic. Well, I failed, right? Now, five years later, because it's trendy, more and more of the raw material suppliers are doing the product toxicity. What does that mean? I mean, they're, they're testing on fish. And as much as I don't like the idea of testing on fish, I like the idea of selling a product that is harmful to the fish and believing that it's safe even less. Well, smart friends, please work on that for me. Yes, sir. Do I ever get the 
feeling that it's my company against the world. Sometimes it feels like an uphill battle, but one of the amazing things that I like to say is um, I don't have customers out there, we have advocates. And every time that I have somebody out there who tries to slam me for something, I have beautiful friends like you that put them in their place before I even say it. So it's, no, I don't feel like it's me as well. I think that it's me and some of my friends helping to educate the world. And hopefully you'll be one of those friends. Yes? <laughs> uh, so do we have any internship or research opportunities? Yeah, call me. It's, uh, I live in a really rural town in Wichula, Florida, Central Florida, and we don't have a whole lot of dough. We've got a lot of great ideas and we need a lot of help. So especially um, marketing, science communication, science communication, how do you tell this stuff to the world? How do you talk about it? We definitely need help with that. Um, video, communications, technology, definitely. Great question. Thank you. I would toss you something, and I will before we're done. My arm's not so good. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions out there? This was wonderful, friends. Thank you all so very much. One more kiss. Sorry. It's okay. Right. As far as makeup. Yeah, makeup. Okay. Sure. Are there any particular brands that you recommend or that are that you know are actually yeah, so makeup companies that are doing good in the world. Um, I like uh, Honeybee Gardens. It's a beautiful, sweet little company. Um, you can buy them online. I think they're in Whole Foods. Um, Marinum is a mineral makeup brand, also, and they're not overly expensive. And again, going back to the economic side of it, the mineral suns, the mineral makeups, and a lot of these products are a little more expensive than Maybelline and some of those. But usually, you'll find again, you don't need to use quite as much, and it'll hold longer. Um, so yeah, there's some really good sweet brands out there doing good in the world. Um, look at your local health food store. That's a good place to start. All right. So there were some beautiful pictures that were up here earlier. Did you guys see the slideshow, Nina? I had some questions about sharks. You guys mind if I put it back on? If anybody needs to leave, I understand. We've been talking a long time, but I'm going to put the sharks back up. And if anybody has questions about those images, John, who is my partner over here, I get to bring my photographer with me every time we go underwater. Pretty awesome. And he'd be delighted to answer any questions about underwater photography, um, the health of the reefs around the world, as well as shark diving with sharks and taking pictures of large animals. So I'm going to pull that back up. And thank you for your time. I really I met Honor about a dive boat in Key Largo, and uh, we've been diving together now for about seven or seven years, and we've traveled all over the world. One thing that we're seeing, with very few exceptions, is the reef. There's no more big fish, and there's, there's uh, wherever you go, the reefs are fished out. Uh, in in uh, developing countries, it's normally a matter of, uh, of economics. Well, a lot of started a club for girls. Uh, and I mean, this is just a few of the places we went. I particularly like taking pictures of sharks. I used to have a fear of them until I learned about them, and they're not what, uh, what uh, you see in Hollywood. Uh, we have uh, Blanche's Reef, my favorite reef down in Fiargo. It's uh, alive. Uh, it's pretty, it was pretty beat up by the hurricane, but that's part of Mother Nature's renewal. Uh, we have, right now, it's incredibly clear water in uh, we got nice fish, nice turtles, and so a few resident reef sharks. Uh, we got a few black wrecks and a few arm races, the uh, 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 Spiegel Grove wreck, and it started, it started getting more and more reef shark, uh, Caribbean reef shark. This is the Aquarius uh, habitat. You want one, uh, this is a little camera. You can pick, uh, pick that up and, and see it. Uh, Caribbean reef shark, Caribbean reef shark. These are all red. These are three. We watched uh, some of these. This is a Duane wreck. That's my favorite wreck in Key Largo. That's a particularly good day. That's a bull shark there, man. Bull shark. Generally, you don't have problems with sharks unless you got a dead fish with you. Because then that's what, that's what their food is. Uh, the turtles we're seeing are. are uh, 
uh, uh, penalty there, and this is a resident hurdle on the land. We'd like to nice to come up here as picture tape. Eagle rays are in right now. They're beautiful. We got uh, one of our first dives. We got into school of 40 of them. And we had uh, we were just training with our, our weed weathers. We had our scooters. And we got into the school of 40 eagle rays and they just swam with us. It was a uh, it was a great experience. That's the stern of the land right in the resident girl. I saw him in her weed weaver. Bottom hitting shot. That's me. <laughs> this is uh this is the uh, Benwood wreck. It's a natural wreck. This was at the dock. Uh, we came in from a dive and, um, and the manatee were in, and I slipped into the water and they got decided to be for the gym. There's a family group. That's dad. And this is what happens to them is with the speedboats. It's a real issue. This is a resident reef shark with a little bling. Almost all the fish, the sharks you see now have some sort of hook in them. These folks, I don't know who they were. They, uh, they were on the reef down there and they just came down. I had my big camera and they were just hamming it up. <laughs> now this is in, uh, this is in the Bahamas. And, uh, the, uh, it's quite porpoisey over there. And these porpoises stayed, uh, these dolphins stayed with us for a good 30 minutes. And interacted with uh, with us. It was wonderful. Uh, they were playing their family groups, and uh, this was a lot of them. Mother and the son. Water and turtle. He's an old man to see there. And the Bahamas being is very sharp. This is a Caribbean reef shark, Caribbean reef shark. This is with Stewart's Cove in uh, Nassau. And they do one of the best shark dives, best, uh, best and safest shark dives. Autumn's particularly fond of uh, octopus. She found this one on her own. And it just sat there, let her take a ton of pictures. Now, her pictures are far better up than mine because this is after she took the pictures. And I came over and got pictures of her taking pictures. <laughs> This is a tiger shark named uh, Jenny. That's what they look like coming at you. <laughs> now, I mean, that, this is uh, Jenny with some black. It's a lemon shark. And then uh, this Caribbean reef shark. Hammerhead. Yeah, yeah. I like the hammerhead. Yeah. This is in, uh, this is in uh, Benin. It's about 20 feet of water, one tank dive, it's almost two hours long. And they just kind of, they come and they come until you quit beating them and they go away. This one's, uh, uh, this one's in Tiger Beach, that's a pregnant 14 foot female. These are all great, uh, great hammerheads. So, and uh, at Tiger Beach in the Bahamas, they hang the bait up high and it draws all the smaller sharks, so you can uh, you can get this picture. This fellow is a lawyer in Houston, and he has that uh, picture hanged in his office now. Twin tigers. And you hear the membranes coming up over its eyes. It's uh, it's only about a foot away. Bottom getting shot. Now, this one here came down the line of divers and hit every dome for it until it found the feeder and then it lost interest in all the rest of us. Bottom getting shot. <laughs> Not such good visibility as a bomb. The Honda is known for its crystalline one uh, visibility. Now, K South Bank that belongs to the Bahamas, and, and it's, uh, this is uh, K South, and there's a bank there that is, uh, that, and it's just it's one of the more pristine reefs I've seen. It's kind of difficult to get to. Gray Angel. 
I can't recall the name of this, but it sits there and sucks little stuff out, more grain. This is the soft corals, are very prevalent and beautiful down there. The turtles are really friendly. We have a particular thing, and then the dolphins are real friendly. And it's strange to see the spotted dolphin with uh, with the other fin. And here they were they were family groups of mating pairs of spotted and and uh, I can't recall the name of the other dolphin. And these two swam with uh, with uh, uh, Allison for quite some time. We enjoy dolphins. That's all. Awesome. This is about it's twenty five hundred feet to the bottom. That's a pretty good ledge here. We got a chance to go to Fiji on a school girls trip, and it was wonderful. We're in wonderful people, and. Uh, some of the best coral we've seen. The only better coral I've seen is a place called Flinders Reef in, uh, in the Coral Sea off Australia. And that was pretty soon. This is pretty close to me. Now, the shark dives there, they have you behind the uh, Behind that, and these, this one's this shark thing, uh, uh, no top, it doesn't have a top dorsal fin. They're all 14 foot or better pregnant females. This is the female. No top. Wonderful water was wonderfully clear. The islands were beautiful. Some of them had lots of smaller fish, jackknife fish, uh, butterfly, royal angel. Dude, this is yeah, this is a new rock. Uh, damselfish. I'm glad they don't get very big. That's a, uh, this is a lightning clam at night. It, when it opens its mouth, you can see a phosphorescence. It looks like lightning in its mouth. It's a clown trigger fish. And we found Nemo. <laughs> this is a ghost puffer. Kind of shy. And this is an enemy fish. It's lovely enemies. This is a clam that lives in a coral. And how it grows any bigger is beyond me. Black tip shark, school up. They stay clear of the feeding because of the tide. This is a uh, decorated crab. They wear a sponge and, on them, and they, they place it on like a hat and walk around like you can't see them. <laughs> Smiling for the camera. And a better look at the village there. And, uh, this is a uh, 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 Anyway, this is Bonaire. It's like a desert island. And it's just, this is a wonderful, this is a two hours uh, south of Key Largo, or, and, uh, and it's, it's a diver's paradise. They're, they're most popular wreck. This is a helmet hooker wreck. This is the, what they call salt pier. It's a pier where the, they uh, they have salt ponds there. They drive the, the seawater and make sea salt, and that's where they load the ships. Giant, I mean, giant ships come in and they load it with salt. Uh, and uh, it's the mounds are as big as three-story buildings. It's a pretty cool. <laughs> I 
you see some odd couples like this. <laughs> and, and, uh, this is a ton of wreck uh, out there. It's, we enjoy that. There's a lot of a lot to see. It's only about 70 feet. Uh, coral crab. And this is an eel snake. And uh, a particular variation of eels. What's that on? What? What is it? Anemones, cowfish, puffer, stonefish. Indigo hammer. Yeah. I love these guys, frogfish. These are, and, and finding one of these on your own is thrilling, a thrill of the discovery. Bonnie is one of our favorite spots. Golden eyes, Maria. Come to uh, Peterson. Come to Soapfish. Flounder. These tarp, and this is a little collapsed cave, and the tarp and filled this whole uh, uh, this whole little lagoon there with the turtles. There. On the night dives there, the tarpon will come up and lay in beside you and shine a light on a little fish and race out to get That's the stern of the dumb hooker. Wonderfully alive. They're starting to ban fishing there, and the fish population is getting bigger. Last time we were down there, we, uh, we actually had, uh, this, you're starting to see more and more big fish. Fine fish are invasive, but they're very beautiful. So, uh, sturgeon, black sturgeon, rainbow uh, parachute. We went to Guadalupe Island, died with white sharks. This is the cage. I, I thought I'd get out of the cage until we got a little experience with them. Then I stayed in the cage. And you don't have to be a qualified diver. We had one girl on the boat that was uh, had never been uh, scuba diving before. You, they give you a hose with a reg, second stage regulator and uh, and like 30 pounds of weight. And you sit and you stand in the bottom of that cage and so on. They call it scuba or, or uh, uh, we call it something else. Uh, but, uh, and you don't have to be certified and you go down there. So three, we were here for three days and it wasn't enough time. Yeah, that's a breeding spot. I, I guess they're not real romantic. Well, why not? Exactly. Uh, we call her Scarface. These are all female. Uh, you don't see many male whites. Uh, we, there's a, the only known male tiger is in Jupiter, Florida. Well, I got some pretty good pictures of him. <laughs> then I learned to use Photoshop. <laughs> and 
Jupiter, Florida is, is one of the best kept secrets. There's some wonderful diving up there. Uh, it's my friend Randy Jordan. He runs the shark diving operation. We got uh, this uh, little uh, 25 foot uh, uh, whale shark came through one day. Randy had to go say hi. That's his bubbles in front of it. It went vertical. So I give you a little size perspective. Now this is a 25 footer. It's considered juvenile. What he did is he got in front of it. It went vertical and allowed all the other divers to come and swim against the current. This uh, Jewfish, that's a uh, sandbar shark. And quite a pronounced dorsal fin. One of my favorites. Another tiger. This is a silky shark. They're, uh, they're upper water shark. You find it there. Lemon shark. Sandbar shark. Tiger. I like these little fish that swim in front of them, the pilot fish. They actually swim with the big shark for protection. The tiger and I'm not sure, I believe. These are beautiful animals, but what you don't want to do is turn your back on them. You got to keep them from this one. They're very curious. And if they think they've got an opportunity, they're going to come over to see if you're food. This is a dusty shark. Silky. He's using, uh, as an example, the camera like this, he's using a 10 millimeter lens. You get this picture, that shark's about a foot away from the lens. This is about three feet. That's Patrick. That's, uh, that's one, of the, one of the few pictures you'll ever see of a male shark, a male tiger. Is a pack of time, time. full shark, lemon shark. That's the bon air wreck in the background. That's a tiger shark set. Down a bit, three down here. And the silk. This is a shark dive. They have it's a three tank dive and, uh, and they feed. This is the back of the wreck. They ask people to stay up there and they feed them more and it's like a hard for you. And then later when the, when they start, when the feeder feels like it, you can come down if you want to. All of my spent a lot of time up there until we became comfortable enough to move down and get closer to them. The Goliath uh, uh, group of are, there's a lot of them down there in aggregation. And so you see 50 or 60 of them, uh, 300 pound Goliath grouper surrounded this huge bait ball. It's pretty spectacular. You swim there, they're on wrecks normally, and you swim through the bait ball to get to the wreck, and then all of a sudden, here's a 300 pound grouper. Oh, I'm getting shot. Reach. Lemon sharks. The lemon sharks, uh, while well, they look gnarly, they're quite classy. They, uh, they really don't bother you. 
So they'll move away. Most sharks, when the divers are in the water, unless there's dead fish in the water, will move away from it. He's got a he's got a whole plastic box full of dead fish trying to get them out. This whole thing got ran like the was an avid spear fisherman, and he didn't want to give up his fish to the sharks, so he would fend off the sharks, and then he would play with them. And you know, that's a bad idea. Racing in there with your hand out and pet it. But, uh, uh, and then some photographers heard about him. This guy wouldn't give up, so they asked me, Can I go on and take pictures? And it turned into a, a short uh, a photo op thing. So, uh, and we figure it's good for the sharks to, uh, for people to be educated more about them, get, get, get to know them. And really know that they're not everything that's packed up. You know, and Hollywood makes them full sharp. Tiger. Full sharp. They're actually quite difficult to get a picture of. That's Randy's boat with the one shark that he's wrong for that. That's what my camera looks like in the big old court. The girls. But you know, from the Galapagos, he's. <laughs> this is Randy. Oh, shoot, fish. Oh, you get the shot. I like the small ones too. This was her first shark dive. She did quite well. This this guy, I, I did his open water class. This is his first night dive. He was 12 years old. He's a great kid. Autumn and uh, Bobby. Bottom and the this is one of the caves up in uh, cave country. This is a local Pennsylvania girl, Becky Kagan shot. She was our instructor. And we did this photo shoot with uh, these folks that uh, they're professional mermaids and they do shows and stuff. And, uh, and they wanted to support auto, so they offered to do this. She's, she's, the water's cold. She's pretty, pretty. And she doesn't dive with a mask. Her eyes are open with no protection. And I, she says, after a while, you have to Photoshop the red out of my eyes. <laughs> uh, but it was wonderful. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. So, I, like, is photography, like, your... Job. Like, like, I'm just wondering how you got to go to all of these different classes. <laughs> well, I, I, worked, I worked really hard for a lot of years and uh, uh, I was a helicopter pilot around here. I flew up for Staten Medivac and uh, uh, my last job was with, I was flying from Paul Allen off one of his uh, super yachts and, uh, and I bought a little house down in Key Largo and when I retired and decided I was going to go diving every day. I did it, I got a photo buff and I finally got into Photo Autumn actually taught me into getting a big camera. We started taking pictures, and every opportunity we get, we go diving. Work hard, play hard, right? Yeah. yeah. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and now she's got me up there helping her build her, build her company up. I'm um, kind of like uh, facilities management. I'm getting all the all the equipment ready to make sunscreen. Uh, she has a friend making it for her now. And we're going to start making it our own. We bought a warehouse and a factory, and now we're getting ready to do that. It's kind of cutting into my diving, but I. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, other, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Can you talk about the sharks? What's that? Can you talk about the sharks more? Can I what? Talk about the sharks more? Uh, what's your shark question? Okay. Um, Sharks are scary, right? Pink, gnarly teeth and that. Really, they're only interested in dead fish. They're looking for food. Uh, uh, I'll come back to that. Yes, ma'am. So, like, how do you 
So would you say that like education through like pictures like this and just telling people, is that like the best way to get over this misconception that sharks are like these mean, scary creatures? I, you know, I've been, you know, I go to the reef. I say, oh, I hope we see a shark today. And I hear someone in the back. They go, I don't want to see any sharks because we've got this misconception that Hollywood's given us about evil. If you go back to some of the old boy bridges, sea hunt stuff, and they talk about nurse sharks like they're violent killers and they're going to come out of nowhere and eat you. And, you know, we see the news with the shark attacks and stuff. There's generally, uh, it's generally misidentification. Uh, sharks are, are uh, apex predators that feed on other fish. And generally, sharks, generally speaking, shark attacks are caused by one or two things. Misidentification, they mistake a, a person for a fish in murky water, or the person has a dead fish on the shark's trying to get. Uh, spear fishermen, for instance, have a real problem with sharks, especially in North and uh, in uh, the uh, east coast of Florida. The uh, uh, bull sharks are very aggressive. Uh, if you got a dead fish, otherwise they stay away from you. It's hard to get a picture of a shark unless someone's got to introduce some bait into the water. Uh, I've got a few, but it's rare. Uh, Sharks are, 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 you know, they've spent their whole lives growing up and seeing all their mates eaten by bigger fish. And they don't know what you are. They know what dead fish is, so. so and that's it. They're after that. Uh, so generally, you don't have a shark problem unless you got a dead fish with you or if you're in murky water. Uh, we see that we saw that, uh, I think, year before last. Uh, there was a series of shark attacks, especially in North Carolina around. Uh, and uh, around uh, Myrtle Beach. Uh, and I know that pier, I used to sail out of there. And they were fishing for sharks, chumming in the water, and it's murky. And those people were swimming in the chum line. Um, and they got hit. And they don't want to say anything about that. You just don't see them. Uh, they were owners, so I saw. Uh, and and it was we were shocked when we saw it. I was there the first time it came up, and Patrick's been kind of hanging out. Now they named all of them, uh, and it was it's a wonderful surprise for us. But it's the only male I've ever seen. Uh, I don't know that they even have it. They see many uh, whites. It seems like those apex predator males, or they, uh, you know, it's uh, it's all a dominance thing. And the females are okay, but the males are out on the periphery until it's time, right? Well, that's uh, not the case with whale sharks, female whale sharks. Yeah, you see by that, uh, that young juvenile uh, that was on the video, that was a male. And it's, uh, uh, it, it's surprising you know, that you see them. Uh, but something about the, about the, the apex predators, is, uh, uh, you just don't see a lot of the male. And, uh, we've had one person tell us that. Uh, the Jupiter Shark Dive is probably the only place you'll go where they actually where they do a midwater feeding, uh, and and he's it's it's an experience because you've got someone uh, someone that takes you there and tells it's more friendly than what it used to be, uh, but it's, uh, but they they tell you what to do, and they tell you what to wear. And you say, don't pet the sharks, don't do this and that. And you could stay far enough away. First time I went, I said, I was watching this, and they were probably they were giving the dive brief. I said, um, when this guy starts getting eaten, there's nothing we can do to save him, we're just gonna fade back, okay? And, and I I you know, it just doesn't happen uh, uh, because they're only after the fish, right? And Randy even puts it on a stick and hands it to him. He, he gets in, but he really loves the sharks, and, and, and uh, it's something to see. But seeing it and seeing the behavior, the more you know about something, uh, the, and the less fear you have of it, right? It's the fear of something you have now. Uh, any more questions? Yes, ma'am. So when you go out and dive with the sharks, so you mainly bring it for like recreation and take pictures, or yeah. have you done like shark tagging at all? No, I don't, uh, the tag. I don't know that I agree with the tagging. Most of it is we've gone on a couple of shark tagging things. What they do, they catch them, they drag them up on the boat, they put a hose in their mouth, and they and they uh, they drill uh, through the fins and put this uh, GPS tag on it. 
Either that or they put another tag on it, and there's a whole bunch of ink, and it's not particularly good for the shark. You wonder when do the studies end, right? Uh, and and we're, I mean, we've seen some of them that's you're thinking, well, how many of them actually survived the tagging, right? And I mean, you, we see the tags. I got pictures of them. I, there's a, a shark guy that I, I sent. When we don't know one of the tigers, all have names, they're all identified. Their stripes and their, their markings are individuals. That's like fingerprints. And uh, we got guys, this guy that follows us because he's following the sharks. And, uh, and he bought a uh, truck, Trubbish, which is in Stephen Trumpovich, he's down there with the uh, University of Florida, and he's like the, the go-to guy. I said, hey, Stephen, what's this shark's name? And he says, oh, that's so, so oh, that's un unidentified. You know, he's, he's really good at it. And uh, he's doing some good research down there. Uh, but uh, like anything else, they're predators. And we're seeing more of them in coastal waters, and my personal belief is that the unrestricted fishing in international waters has depleted the offshore and the open water sharks food supplies and that they uh, they've gone where the feet the where the food is and the food is in territorial waters where we have fishing regulations trying to sustain our our fish populations from collapse and uh, we see it uh, the, the overfishing area the population collapses the good news is if you quit fishing them for a couple of years it miraculously comes back uh, so uh, uh, that's what we're seeing. Yeah, the shark tagging, in my opinion, it's one of those things where it's become like it's trendy. Kind of like a tourist thing. I mean, you want to you want to see sharks go do the tagging, and they're getting big bucks for it, which helps support their efforts, which is great. But it's it's hard. It's hard to watch. It's hard to watch them catch these sharks, these beautiful animals, pull them up on board. You know, shove the toes in. It wasn't what I expected, and kudos to them. We need to research, but the single shark you see out there stuck these tags in them. It's, it's Either that or they've got hooks on them. You yeah, know, there's the fishing, the walmart hooks. And, yeah. Lots of hooks. Um, it's it's hard, to, hard to see. Yeah. Um, Randy's they have yeah, they he's got a whole collection of hooks. He takes he beats so he takes um silkies and he twists their tail and puts them in a tonic trance one of the other divers. We'll take the hook out. That's pretty cool. And you go, okay, that's ballsy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, sir. So they shove the hose in to irrigate, irrigate the yeah. hills while they're doing the tag? They catch them, pull them up on the boat, put the hose in to, uh, to, to uh, uh, yes, like yeah, an air. Yeah, yeah, keep them breathing. Yeah, keep them breathing. Keep them hydrated. Yeah. Keep them hydrated. Yeah. And then uh, they do their thing. They, may, they knock it out real quick because the longer they keep it on the boat, they, it's it's a really a well uh, geared process that they do. We went to was that University of Miami, and uh, we went out with them out as one of their tagging operations, and, and it was it was real interesting. I don't I don't know. That's a good thing. Yes, sir. Yeah, that, and there's different ways of doing the same thing. And that's, you know, that shark's already already been caught, drugged up, and, and it's uh, it's been stressed, right? So now it's been defeated, okay? And it's stressed. The boat's in, it's in the water, it's moving uh, to keep the water flowing through its gills, and they do their, their tagging real quick and they release it. And hopefully it'll swim off. Now, I don't think they, they put these geotags on them, and that it still has to come up close enough to, to the surface to uh, to get a penny, right? Uh, they did a lot of them with the whites. I mean, there's a great white shark trap I watch all the time uh, because I've had them all around me. I've never seen them down in the, in, the, in the Keys along the East Coast. And uh, there's a couple of videos out there. So you do a uh, uh, search for YouTube for a great white shark uh, on Key Largo or a Dwayne wreck, and there's a, a guy, his first, he, he did a first dive of the year, and his first dive with a GoPro, and they're going down the line, and this white shark comes and circles them, and they got the, the GoPros going off, they get down onto the wreck, and and the sharks around there, and then they go inside the wreck, and, I'm, and we ask the, the instructors, what do you, what'd you do that for? You're doing a, a tropical water 
out of cage, great white shark guy, and he went in the wreck, and he goes, no, it was just a shark, man, I know what it was. <laughs> it wasn't a very big one, and, and they, the shark, the white sharks you see down there, are uh, they're following the schools of fish, and they're not feeding on marine mammals, right? Uh, but it's like a guy in North Carolina, I was talking to him, we had white sharks in the area. And I, I talked to him about it, he said, John, the best thing I can say about white sharks is they're unstable. He said, one minute, they'll be fine. Next minute, they're on you. You know, they're going nuts. Speaking of that, do you have any tips for like shark fighting safety? Um, things that you've observed? Yeah, we, we call it yum yum yellow. You know, those yellow fins and stuff, uh, time and time again, I see sharks go fight. They, they're looking for food and they see it. White fins, uh, yellow fins are, are mostly white looking at depth because the yellow spin bites been absorbed, right? And uh, and and what is uh, something dead in the water look like? White. And I've seen it time and time again. Girls with uh, big long bums, I've seen those tigers come up behind them and test it. You know, uh, and uh, it's, it's pretty free. Uh, if you've got a tiger shark near you, you want to keep your eye on it. Make you keep eye contact with it. You turn your back on it, and it may come over and see if you're food. You know, we had one guy who turned his back on one, and it came down and bit his shoulder. It just did, just touched it. He left a, sh uh, a tooth in his wedding, but it didn't didn't scratch him. I right? tell you, you're not food. But, what? It's not, you're not a dead fish. <laughs> There's, I'm sorry? Uh, I don't know what attracted it. Was kind of, it. It was during a feed, and he, but he was back away from the dead fish, so the shark was interested. He knew there was feed there, food there somewhere. And um, generally, unless you got a dead fish on you, or you're in murky water with with sharks, uh, surfers. Uh, have you ever seen that comparison between the swimming, uh, swimming seal and a surfer on a surf paddling out on a surfboard? The silhouette is uncannily look alike. And great whites do this this uh, vertical attack, and uh, and that's why the why that happens. As, uh, people in the murky water, especially murky water near uh, this brackish, there's something about the brackish water, the the bulls. Start feeding on there, and they're biting anything that they see, right? So a, a white leg, that first shark attack I know of that uh, that I witnessed uh, was a fisherman, and so it was a, a, a weight fisherman. He, we had a stringer of uh, fish on him. And he's catching, and he's catching fish in South Texas, on South Padre Island, and uh, a brown shark came up, took the fish, and caught his calf, and severed an artery and he died of it. But they don't eat the people, right? When you hear shark yeah. attacks, you don't hear of like, oh, the shark ate them. You hear, you know, the shark will come. It'll, if it happens to bite, sometimes it can be bad, depending on where it is. But they bite, they let go. They don't yeah. eat the person, right? Because we're not their food choice. Yeah. Yeah, we've we we've food seen food. it. I've tried to get pictures of sharks um, down the wrecks and in Key Largo. You see them. You want to move, if you want to move a shark away, you swim towards it. It turns away from you and swims away, uh, as most fish do, because that uh, because when you get the, the way to get closer is it is you parallel and real slowly move in. Okay, and, and there's something about being lower than them. If if you go, especially sea turtles, if you come in from above, it spooks them. If you come in from underneath them. And don't go right at them, just kind of edging towards them. You can get closer. Same thing with octopus. Yeah. You're up, they run away. You're down, yeah. curious. They get curious. They, you see those little eyes come out of the hole. Next thing you know, I had one on an uh, octopus on the wreck. It, was, it lived in this old air conditioner. It was off the wreck. And I started taking uh, uh, cans of uh, sardines down. I would put the sardine down. And take it, need it, and, it, and it eventually it'd see me coming and come all the way out and reach and he'd be like, come on. <laughs> 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 but else would, so it actually recognize it. Yeah. Yeah, 
this one, we like we like the octopus. So my fun dive is I take the rebreather, the scooter, and the scooter, and I place up all the lost dive here on the wrecks down in Key Largo. And, uh, and, and I quick range snorkels up because they're wonderful little habit to octopus habitat. So now I find an old snorkel, I stick it in the sand, and it's waves down there, and that octopus has some place to hide. <laughs> you bring the octopus up, and one time it'd be on the deck, and a little baby octopus was. You bring the circle up, a little baby octopus would come crawling out of it. They're like, ah, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so we don't bring the circles up anymore. That's classic to say. And you can't just throw them back in the water because fish can eat them. So you, we take them inside a coke can, and we put and we put them into the coke can full of salt water, and let it go to the bottom, and I please up the coke can next time we go down. <laughs> Yes, so then I remember watching like Shark Week and stuff, and they would have stories about shark attacks on the show. And I remember this one story: a uh, lady had gotten bit by a shark. The shark held on to her and shook her around for quite a bit of time. Now, how accurate are those stories? They're pretty accurate. All those attacks happen, but generally speaking, those with the initial attack was because of mistaken identity. The shark thought. For some reason, they were food or not your part. Now, if you're, uh, you can go to the, the, the wrecks like the Indianapolis, where they had all those sailors in the water, and uh, and so many of them were taken by the sharks. If you're floating on the surface at night, and there's a, and there's a lot of mutilated bodies around you, you've got a shark problem. Okay. Um, but, right, yeah. Uh, we'll keep talking diving for. Yeah, but I, I can talk about sharks and stuff all day long. Come talk about sharks with us at the Thanks, everyone, so much.